All right, I'm delighted to introduce our three athletes joining us this evening. First up, we've got Alicia Newman. She is a University yes. of Miami alumni and the current Canadian record holder in the pole vault with 4.82 meters. Uh, she's always had the dream of representing Canada, but it was initially in the sports of gymnastics. However, at a young age, she was forced to take a break due to an injury. And it was during that time that her mother actually signed her up for track and field. And she started running distance hurdles, but then was later introduced to pole vault where she started excelling, uh, setting national records at the youth and junior uh, level, and then going on to become a five-time All-American and claiming the silver medal at uh, the 2016 NCAA Division I Track and Field Championships. She kept the momentum rolling that season and made her debut at the 2016 Rio Olympics and continued on to win gold at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. Alicia, welcome. And how are you doing today? Where are you joining us from? I'm good. Thanks for that introduction, Natalie. That was so nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm joining in from Toronto. So excited to be here and speak to everyone. Well, welcome. We are so, so excited to have you. And next up, we have Christabel Nettie. So she is an Arizona State University alumna and the current Canadian record holder in the long jump with 6.99 meters. Uh, from a young age, Christabel uh, dreamt of competing for Canada on the world stage, and she found success early on, making her first Canadian team at the age of 14, competing at the World Youth uh, Track and Field Championships in the long jump and 100 meter hurdles back then. Since then, she's focused on long jump and in 2013 claimed the silver medal at the 2013 NCAA Division I Indoor Track and Field Championships. And she's gone from gold at the 2015 Pan Am Championships, represented Canada as well at the 2016 Rio Olympics, and like Alicia, won gold at the 2018 Commonwealth Games. So Christabel, we are so happy to have you. Uh, how's your day going and where are you joining us from today? Hi, thank you. I'm in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And yeah, I'm excited to be here and um, share my story. Well, we're so excited to have you as well. And last but not least on our athlete panel today, we've got Liz Lido, uh, Lido, who is a University of British Columbia alumni and the current Canadian record holder in the javelin with 64.83 meters. Liz played lots of sports growing up, including fastball, and it was in grade eight gym class when she actually threw her very first javelin and proved to be more coordinated than the others and was invited to try out for the track team. Like Alicia and Christabel, she found success early on uh, qualifying for her first youth championship just one year after deciding to focus on track. Very impressive. She broke the national youth record and went on to become a four times NAIA champion. Uh, has won a total of nine Canadian titles in Javelin, won gold at the 2015 Pan Am Championships, and became the first Canadian woman to qualify for the Olympic Javelin since 1968 um, in her debut in 2012. She also, like these other ladies, competed at the 26, 2016 uh, Rio Olympic Games, making her a two-time Olympian and hopefully soon to be three. So Liz, Pleasure to have you with us today. And I know you're usually in British Columbia, but where are you joining us from today? I drove to Alberta over three days. I am with my coach here and I'm, uh, I'm just getting setting up, set up. So I just had my first practice and uh, yeah, it's nice to be back here. I train here part-time. So it's nice to get back on my feet and kind of back into some momentum. Fantastic. What's the weather like over there? Uh, it's windy. It snowed a little, it was sunny. Classic Alberta, everything. <laughs> Unpredictable. Yeah. Well, ladies, we are so thrilled to have you here um, this evening. And it's really amazing. I was thinking to have three of you women who are so successful in your respective um, sports since the youth level. I think you all represented Canada um, in youth at the world stage. And you're still excelling today and enjoying the sport. So 
I'm thrilled um, to have you here and share your journey, your experience through these years and share some advice with some of the athletes we have here today who are, whether you know they're just starting the sport, making the decision where to go to university or even just uh, debating to stay in it. So mm -hmm. I'll kick things off with uh, Alicia talking a little bit about how you got started in the sport. So you were involved mm -hmm. in gymnastics at a young yeah. age. And I was wondering what was it in track and field that made you fall in love with it? I think the best thing, I mean, obviously number one, I think track and field, just being outside and being able to be in the sun and compete. But what I loved about track and field was how um, relatable to men it was. So I love that females could be competing in the same events as males. And it was a very much an equilibrium for us as um, I guess you could say training partners, you know, you would go, you'd show up, it was unisex. And I love that males would push each other, you know, and, and, and push female, but track and field to me has always been, um, you can work at it and you can be one of the best in the world if your mind allows you to. So I think the best thing about track and field is you can constantly get better until your body really tells you you can't. So um, with gymnastics, I kind of had that plateau. I, I grew a little too tall and the skills started getting a little harder. So um, for me to transition and use my gymnastics career and almost be an Olympic level in gymnastics, um, I thought kind of my, my, you know, all, I guess my athletic career was over, but I soon later found that because I did gymnastics, I could be one of the best pole vaulters in the world. And so um, I guess there's when one door's open, another door, another door opens. Right. And that's what I found with track and field. And it just it accepted me and it allowed me to shine in a different way and, and still represent Canada. Mm. Well, and it definitely prepared you to excel in the sport that mm -hmm. you're in today, pole vault. I know a lot of yeah. gymnasts end up in um, pole yeah. vault within the track and field realm as well. But you started mm -hmm. off in the hurdles, right? So yeah, I did. What was that actually, transition, um, mm -hmm. what made you choose hurdles and then continue on to pole vault? Well, I, I really did try like every event. I actually did a little pentathlon at first, and I loved it. And I loved the fact that I was able to, you know, vertically jump high and horizontally jump high, and then run as fast as I can. And I loved it. But I just the natural ability and, and hurdles. I loved how fast the race was. You know, you were in the zone. You were quick. That thirteen seconds of, you know giving it your all and then it being done and over. And, but when you go from training 32 hours a week in gymnastics to a 13 second race, it just wasn't enough for me. I wanted to be out in the field longer. I wanted to do a sport that I could actually like, you know, see my potential each day. Um, and so pole vault brought that to me. I was able to, you know, you could be in the best shape at all times in pole vault and you could have, you know, two really bad jumps, but still the third attempt down the runway, if you make it, you make it, you get three more attempts. And I just love the, the duration that pole vault allowed me to mm -hmm. have in track. The excitement. And I guess always the room mm -hmm. for improvement. Right. And I think yeah, you, for sure. you touched on a good point, just being young. Um, a lot of athletes, I think at that age are involved in multiple different sports yeah. and does contribute um, going forward, which brings me mm -hmm. to Liz. I know you grew up playing um, a lot of team sports, including basketball. So what was it that made you decide to kind of stop that and really focus on the javelin? I know it was kind of gym class that kicked that off, but eventually you decided one year to really take it more seriously and focus on it. And that's what um, a year later you made your first uh, national team. Yeah, it's, uh, it was very interesting for me. I'd like to say, and on average, so I'm six one. perceive that. I'm very strong, but I'm, I'm not overly as a human being it's gotten a lot better since I've stopped calling myself a class and in general not stop saying that because I you know if you say it, it comes true um but I played fast pitch I played soccer I did break dancing I tried golf I did tennis I like I got hit in the face with a basketball multiple times until grade 11 and I decided that I liked my face and I didn't want to keep damaging it by not, you know having coordination being off um and I uh it was funny it was um, I finally picked up a javelin in grade eight and I was like, oh, I didn't hit myself in the back of the head. Cool. Like, and oh, no one else managed to throw it straight. Weird. So it was like, I kind of just kept going with it. And then in grade 10, um, I had a little bit more coaching from one of the parents at the school. He used to be to Catholic and I ended up throwing 35 meters or 
yeah, or something like that. And um, someone's like, oh, congratulations, you won BC championships. You get to go to nationals. I was like, we have nationals? I literally had no idea this was an Olympic sport. That's how little I paid attention to sports, despite the fact that I played a lot of them. And then I won nationals um, kind of by accident in grade 10. And then I started training. And then the next year I made world youths. So if that's not motivation to quit all the other sports and go into one, I don't know what is. Um, but yeah, there's a, I remember at one point when I first started training, I was 5'11 and I was 135 pounds. And my coach said, oh, you'd be a great high jumper. And I'm like, no, I can't jump. Don't make me. And he's like, no, 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 you should totally try it. I'm like, I really don't want to. Please don't make me. So I go over, I try and do high jump and I, you know, run through a meter 40 and he's like just go back to javelin and never try that again <laughs> no i'm you know i've really i'm a niche athlete i was b plus and everything and then i found javelin it was like it was just my thing yeah you found it well it sounded like you really excelled at it quickly and yeah have gotten a great amount of success so moving on to christabel i know I'm not sure you were involved in so many different sports. I think I read that, you know, track and field was always a part of your life from a young age. And you followed in your sister's footsteps and joined a track club because you were beating all the boys. So you mentioned at first that you weren't that great, but you had a blast at practice. Um, so you kept with it. I was wondering if you can share what your favorite part about that atmosphere was. And when you kind of really found that your hard work was starting to pay off. In yeah. Okay. So yeah, I actually did play a lot of sports. I played basketball, volleyball, I figure skated, I did gymnastics and track and field was kind of the last sport that I did. And yeah, I just followed my sister into it. And it, I think for me, I was, I was pretty good at most sports that I did, but I think what really intrigued me was the social aspect of it. I've always been very, very social. So that was always fun and um, going to track practice for me, even though I wasn't that good, I, we would go from event to event because when you're that young, they just put you in anything. And so it was just a new group that I could just hang out with, laugh with. And for me, that was fun. Like I really didn't care that much. And then um, I was in kind of like, the, I guess the young group and my sister was in like the elite group. And one year that coach told me, like, you're going to come to, you're going to take it serious and you're going to join my group. And he was known as like the very angry coach. He was like very serious. He was always yelling and I was not trying to do that. I just wanted to be there and have fun. But yeah, he kind of changed things for me. Um, back then I was doing pretty much every event. And um, when I joined his group, I started three-stepping in the hurdles. And that's kind of where things took off for me um, at 10, 11, like a lot of kids are five-stepping. So being able to three-step, that kind of catapulted me. So, but I think the main thing for me was just being in a social atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is so. And especially during those developmental years, just having the social and building that community. And I think something you all mentioned is that during those younger years, you really kind of dabbled in all the sports and through experiencing, you kind of found your way in what you enjoyed most and excel that which I think is fantastic so let's get into your kind of recruitment journey from high school um, to college so there are so many different schools out there right there's over 1700 programs in track and field cross country around North America spread across various associations you have NCAA NAIA U Sports CCAA and NJCAA so we're going to get into how you made your decision there. So starting with you, Alicia, uh, mm -hmm. you broke the youth and junior Canadian records and mm -hmm. you became the first high school girl to vault over four meters, um, which yeah. is huge. And I can imagine you had a ton of schools reaching out to you. Did you mm -hmm. have a dream school in mind? I know you initially uh, attended Eastern Michigan, but in the mm -hmm. end, I was wondering if you could share what led you to choose um, the University of Miami. Yeah, so for me, um, I always wanted to go to the States and it wasn't because, you know, it's Canada, but I really just was so mesmerized by Americans mentality of competing in sports and what and how they took it so serious. Um, so for me, I, I, I mean, my dream school was to be in Florida. I always wanted to be somewhere warm where I could train outdoors all year because who doesn't love to be outside in warm weather <laughs> all year? So that was like my original dream school. And I went on a couple visits and what I ended up 
I had a great, great mentor and he really told me, listen, yes, being in Florida, yes, being down South would be amazing for your mental health, but connecting with the coach should be number one. And coach Langley, Gerald Langley at Eastern Michigan, he and I connected on, you know, pole vault level of what we believe the sport is and, and the, and what he believed I could become is what I thought I could become too. And so that's what was really important to me was having and finding that connection with the coach that, um, you know, when I'm down, he's picking me up. And when he has doubts, I'm saying, no, this is not happening. And we connected within that first three days of my visit. And so I was a little upset, but it's so funny how the world works. And, you know, you manifest it in my, my whole high school life. I'm manifesting being in Florida. Well, he got offered a job at university of Miami. And the first thing he said, he goes, I'm taking you with me because he knew the mentality. He knew what I love behind track and field. And he knew I wanted to make this a career. And, and I took it very serious. And, uh, he, he saw the potential and he, he knew I could be one of the best in the world. So it was one of those things. It's crazy how the world works, but, you know, I took one step to go to Michigan and be in Ypsilanti. And now, and then I ended up my whole rest of my career in university for three years at university of Miami. And it was all because of this one opportunity that he got that he shared with me. So, um, I guess in, in, in the recruitment for me, it was a no brainer. You know, I started studying for the ACTs and SATs as soon as I had access to them. And for me, I'm very much more of, um, I guess a math based science based person. So I wrote the ACTs rather than the SATs. And that's where we went from there. And I did my four years there and I actually was going to do um, my master's down in Miami too, but I ended up getting um, turning pro Nike ended up picking me up after NCAA. So um, I kind of had to, you know, you can always go back to school. <laughs> That's very true. It's never yeah. too late. And yeah. just to touch on those, um, those tests. Yeah. Very important mm -hmm. to look into those SATs, ACTs early mm -hmm. on in high school. So um, mm -hmm. as early as, you know, grade kind of 10 11 you can start looking into those as well yeah I hired a tutor and I also um I also wrote them like both of them but I wrote them twice each and honestly it ends up helping because sometimes you can get half academic and half um, athletic scholarship in the states which ends up helping to pay a full ride um, if you aren't as good of an athlete or vice versa right mm -hmm. definitely academics are just as important as athletics mm -hmm. when it comes to scholarships right because they're often yeah. pieced together and I think mm -hmm. that um coach athlete relationship is huge and leading yeah. to Liz your experience I know similar to Alicia you uh were really performing at the youth level and by attention of many schools in North America you were offered um, a full ride scholarship to NCAA Division One programs, but actually chose to stay in your hometown city of Vancouver and commit to UBC. So, can you touch on what made the decision to turn that down those full ride scholarship opportunities, and how you feel your decision of staying in Canada has contributed to, I guess, your success today? Yeah. Um, well, like Alicia, the coach is everything. <laughs> if you don't have the coach then what's the point? I, I mean, you could use it as a vehicle to get you to the school that you want to go to if you're like wanting academics more than sport. But realistically, like if, especially if you're doing a technical event, you have to connect with the coach and you have to believe that they, that you're on the same level and you know what you want. And um, people will take one look at me and they think, oh, she's tall. Like we can get her to, to a ton of events. Maybe we can turn her into a half cat lady. It's like, no, no, no. Like <laughs> What events? Job. That's it. Um, so that was thing one, people want to try and make you a multi-athlete and you have to decide whether you are prepared to do that or not. And I wasn't prepared to do that. Um, the other part was that Javelin is the, has the second highest incidence of injury in track and field next to triple jump. And we have the highest variety of injuries in track and field. And there's a lot of Javelin throwers who have gone down to the States from Canada who never make it out of college because they're just too beat up. And I decided, I was like, I really care about my health and I really want to be with a coach who understands this concept of not breaking me before I've hit my potential. And so there was two coaches that I was very highly considering. I was considering Clemson and I was considering Berkeley. And um, I, Clemson just seemed at the time, I was like, I didn't know a lot about it, but like, they're like, yeah, we're in a forestry program. We're in the middle of nowhere. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that for university. It was, uh, it was a little scary for me. 
and Berkeley was really exciting. So I'd actually gone through the full recruiting process. I got my trip. I'd actually decided to go there. And then when I was probably, I'm not kidding, one signature away from going, I noticed on the piece of paper that it said they wanted me for January after the next year. So they wanted me to start in January instead of September. And I'm like, I'm going to school in September like everybody else. I'm like, I'm, a, I'm already a top eight candidate as a freshman. What do you mean you don't want me for September or October? And they're like, oh, no, we said we wanted you for January. And it was kind of this, like, it totally threw me for a loop. And it was really this thing of, like, well, you're not valuing me. So I think read the paperwork, very important. Um, and I really wanted to go to Berkeley. But at the end of it, I was like, I don't like the way they handled this. And if they're going to handle this like this, then they don't value me. Um, and then I was like, I don't want to go somewhere that I don't feel values what I have to offer. And so it was kind of between UBC and Berkeley and both were great programs, both had good kinesiology schools, both had good science programs. Obviously Berkeley's a little warmer um, and I would have had the NCAA experience, but I chose to stay home because I got to stay with all my friends. Um, a lot of them didn't leave for other colleges. I got to stay with my coach who had kept me healthy and kept me in line and was kind of like a second father and who now I work with again, which is very cool um, at the head and tail of my career. And it just ended up being kind of the perfect combination to stay home because I made a deal with my parents. I was like, if I don't go to Berkeley um, and I don't get a full ride, will you help me to pay for college campus to stay on campus, despite the fact that my house is 15 minutes away from UBC? <laughs> and that kind of made all the difference in the way that I was able to end up kind of making a deal with my parents that I could go to UBC and they could still keep an eye on me being 17 at the time. So that was kind of how I ended up going there. And it ended up being the right decision. Um, you know, I didn't, a lot of the injuries I've sustained have been of me not paying attention or me doing something silly or me standing in the wrong place and getting hit by a hammer, which is a totally separate story. But um, it's, it's very rarely been the coach's problem or someone who was, wasn't creating the program properly. And so with that, I was really happy. That's like, I made the right choice for my health. And that's something that you have to consider if you're in a highly technical event where you could injure yourself or even just some people like get run into the ground and you just want to be careful that you're ready to do all those extra events or you're ready to do the program that they're going to put you on and you have to believe in the program. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing all those great points. And yeah, definitely want to be valued and be respected by the program and the coach at the school for sure. And Moving on to Christabel, I know that, so you went to the U.S. Initially, I know you committed to the University of California, Berkeley, but you actually kind of trusted your gut, you could say, and went on another visit to Arizona State University uh, after committing, which is where you actually ultimately decided to go. So what was it on that, dis on that visit that made you change your mind last minute? Um. So I never, like coming out of high school, I always knew I wanted to go to the States. To me, it was like, that was just the next level. And I didn't necessarily have a dream school, but I just knew that I had to be there. And so luckily my sister went through the whole process before me. So a lot of the schools that had recruited her were recruiting me as well. And so I had her and my dad who did a lot of research for the schools and he kind of, like narrowed it down for me and was like, I think these schools will be in your best interest, but I'm not gonna make the decision for you. So I went um, on a visit to Illinois and the coach there, she she was, um, had Perdita Felician and obviously has had so much success with her as a hurdler. And she's like, I see you as the next Perdita. She just wanted me to hurdle and I wanted to long jump as well. And so, and it was cold and I was coming from, although Vancouver is not freezing, I was like, I need to be in the heat. And so um, I went to Cal Berkeley next and they took me to the football game. I was front row. I had the time of my life. I was at frat parties and I was like the coach, I was connecting with the coach. He was saying everything I needed to hear. And um, he was invested in me as a hurdler and a jumper. And I was like, this is great. Like I left there telling them that I was coming and um, before I had gone there, I, the Arizona State coach had asked me if I would come and I said yes. And then I didn't know, I was shy. I didn't know how to tell him like I already committed. So when he called me after the visit, he said, do you still wanna come? So I said, okay, I'm just gonna go there and then say I didn't like it, but at least I went. And then I don't have to tell him that I'm not coming. And then I went there, it was 
Christmas break. So pretty much campus was empty except for the athletes, student athletes that had to be there. I didn't go to any football game. I didn't have like any campus life experience. It was just me and the team and the coach. And um, yeah, they really sold it to me. And just talking to the head coach, he had coached former world champion in the long jump and he was just fully committed. And he was just telling me that he could see me as the next big thing coming out of Arizona State. And he was committed to my journey. And the hurdle coach there had had, um, he was a new hurdle coach there, but he had had some success too. And I was like, I need to be here. So yeah, it was kind of awkward telling Berkeley, <laughs> never mind. But yeah, it was the best decision. I had a lot of success at Arizona State and it really catapulted my career. And sometimes you just have to look back and think like, wow, what if I had really gone to Cal and I might have been an okay athlete or I might have been a great athlete. You just never know. But I think I did make a good decision by going to Arizona State. Mm -hmm. I would say so too. It's a good thing to follow your gut at the last minute there for sure. So I think you know, they're never going to recruit after Va out of Vancouver again. No. <laughs> 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 oh, exactly. Well, I think it's it's so easy in university to kind of get distracted by you know money, scholarships, facilities, but when it really comes down to it, it sounds like all of your journeys and the reason why you decided was really that coach relationship, training philosophy, and kind of belief in the program, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I think, Sorry. I tell younger athletes this too a lot, is like, it's okay to want to go to the States for the experience. Like, if you, for some reason, you're like, I see myself as like doing four years, but I love my job, and I want to go on to my job after four years, I don't want to be a professional athlete, or I don't see myself going that route. That's mm -hmm. okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You are going for you want your life experiences and it doesn't matter whether it's being an athlete or being fully an athlete, or it's like taking advantage of your athleticism to have an amazing scholarship down in the States. Like it's all cool. Like mm -hmm. there's, yeah. there's more than one way to skin think, a cat, more than one way to live your life. Yeah. I think for me too, I think what I loved was just, you always had to show up in the States. Like there's always another great girl above you. And that's what I wanted to compete with. Cause I know if I could be among one of the best, in the world that I then or compete against the best every meet then it would just put me to that next level too so like saying that to Liz if you want that competitiveness like don't get me wrong there's some great athletes in Canada but to go to every different city just like 20 minute drive to another track there's going to be another girl that either jumps or throws or you know runs just as fast as you and so that's that was a really big reason too that you know people decide to go to the states and that's a good point to bring up too, right? To like know mm -hmm. when you go to the States, like expect, especially in the division one that you girls competed in, like there's high pressure to perform in the athletics, mm -hmm. right? So you have to go well, it's a business, you. right? They're paying Definitely. international fees for you to come all the way down. They expect you to perform. And I think that that's probably a big reason they wanted Liz just in January because Liz can't bring points to indoor season and that's disrespectful absolutely I don't think that that's right yeah. but again it's a business it's it's well you're a jab thrower and you can only do jab outdoors um so it really also like how Liz was saying really being connected to a coach but also value yourself like you're worthy <laughs> you're yeah. allowed to say what you want and if they I bet you if they said well we want okay then Liz will take you in September I bet you stood a little went when you have Liz yeah, exactly. So it's just about valuing yourself too. And, and trust me, like I said, that one door will make shut, but like, there'll be another one that will open. And, and if you go down there and want to be the best, then you will be the best, but you have to want and get that mentality and also know that you're not going to win every meet <laughs> down there. <Definitely>. But, <laughs> but surrounding yourself by greatness is like a really good thing too, right? <laughs> 100%. And that leads me, Alicia, to I guess my next question in your college mm -hmm. experience. Um, so going to University of Miami, which is in the D1, like we've been talking mm -hmm. about, that's a huge jump from high school too, right? So yeah. how do you find like, that jump to that higher competition, load of mm -hmm. academics and balancing, you know, your social mm -hmm. life, being free the first year mm -hmm. away from home as well? How did you go about mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so for me, definitely like Miami is a distraction because I mean, there's something to do Monday through Sunday in Miami and everyone knows that. But I think when you go there as an athlete and, and a student athlete, you have your priorities straight into me. I always tell the younger athletes like parties 
and events and stuff to do will always be there. You will only be an athlete for so long. So for you to go and really dial in in those four years and, and take every ounce of energy or knowledge from the Americans that you can to be one of the best, you will be you will be great. And um, that that was that was my motto going down there was don't get caught up in that social life, really kind of tune into my athletics and, and, and develop as much as I could Um, fail as much as I could was a huge thing too. But the best thing I could say (laughs) to people is um, you, when you go down to the States, you're, you're an athlete first, but you also have to realize you've got to get your academics done. And, uh, and that's the best part is you're doing what you love and Americans put athletics first, but you're getting a degree at the same time. So it's definitely a balance. It's definitely a stress, but it's no different than if you're going to go to school in, in Canada. Right. Um, the, what I loved about the States is they pay their coaches and their university coaches to just be coaches. So my coaches weren't going off and teaching lectures and, and doing that. They were my coach, you know? And so that's where I feel like we miss in Canada a little bit and the difference there. Mm-hmm. Definitely academic um, focus there. And when you touched on social life, I think mm-hmm. uh, one thing that you kind of hinted on was that in university often, as you compete as an athlete, your um, track and field team, your sport, that really goes oh, yeah. on your community and your social. So really mm-hmm. being that as your social time kind of really mm-hmm. helps with mental health team support and doesn't make it feel like, oh, I'm missing the parties because you're having fun. No, not at all. I think at the end of the day too, there's always, um, there's always that one weekend, the whole team goes out and, and it's great because it's like after, you know, a big championship, like everyone's just so excited that we either won or, you know, we work so hard all year to do that. And so you develop really long-term friendships and that's really cool because some of my best friends are not from Canada, which I love. Mm-hmm. And just like you guys, you girls, you all had different journeys, experiences, mm-hmm. but you've come together on the Canadian team. And I know you were chatting all excited to um, catch up today as well, because with COVID, there's been no competition yeah. to really visit. Yeah. Yeah. This spring, hopefully we'll bring more, right? Um, uh, all right, moving on to Liz. Um, during your collegiate career, you won four NAIA titles and went on to break the NAI record, not once, but twice, um, which is huge. What collegiate accomplishment, I was wondering, are you most proud of it? And what was your favorite part of uh, competing in the NAIA? And for those listening, the NAIA is a, a US association, but the University of British Columbia actually competes um, in that association as well as U Sports, which is the Canadian system. Yeah, um, my favorite memories are honestly just training with my training partners, I had a really great group of people. I trained with mostly boys and I like, you know, I'm like Cristobal, I, I like to beat the boys. It's fun. <laughs> I remember at one point in my career, I was split jerking like 225 pounds and one of my male training partners couldn't do it. And I was like, this is the best day of my life. Um, but yeah, so it was like, I got, and it was weird because UBC actually didn't have a track when I went there. I actually threw out of the parking lot out of the football stadium and we'd roll out track and I'd run on the cement, but we'd have this like track surface. And then we'd try and hit the power lines because it was a visual to throw for. And uh, it was like, it was so janky, but it was like, it was so great at the same time because then people be like, wow, what's your training environment? Like you want any eyes? And I'm like, I throw out of a parking lot, like in the pouring rain. Um, and it, you know, it's, it wasn't great in a lot of ways, but another way it made me really value literally having a track under my feet. Um, or like any of those little things. And so my favorite part was, um, you know, we'd train together in the rain and we'd have a really great laugh and, you know, we'd be throwing hard, we'd be trying to beat each other. And it was like this hyper competitive, but really friendly environment. And it was never, you know, this one thing. Yeah. Like winning NAIs was really fun. Um, but nationals in Canada was actually harder for me. So it wasn't my hardest competition of the year. Um, And it was more just the fact that I was in this environment that was like a very, very tight group of like five or six javelin throwers. And it was constant. It was constant for four years. So that was kind of the thing that I really loved about the school that I went to and like my like moments in track that I really hold on to. It's like the pouring wet practice in January that we were still having a great time at. 
Yeah, definitely. I can relate because I myself went to UBC. And like I said, I run. So UBC, for any of those looking, it does have a track today. They've built some amazing facilities. We're not running around on cement parking lots anymore. Uh, and um, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Liz. And I think it goes to show that like all of you ladies have had great amount of success. But looking back, it's really the people you're surrounded with and that experience competing at the collegiate level is so unique um, that you don't necessarily get uh, post collegiately as um, either. So Christabel, um, moving on to you, I know you had um, or you you really enjoyed the team aspect of sport. Um, you mentioned that when you were younger. And during your collegiate years, you definitely realized that track and field isn't, it is an individual sport, but you really found the team atmosphere environment there. Can you touch on what your favorite part of competing as a team was and the impact that you think it left on you today? I think my favorite part of being on a team was when the season was over, but you were in the championship part of the season. So there's only a few people left training and it's just you guys in and out every day. And there's like school's over except for like, school. So you're just training. And if you're taking a class, you're taking a class, but it's just you and your few girls and you go to practice and then pretty much all day, you just wait till the next day. But those bonding moments of just, it's just you guys together when you go to nationals or um, uh, regionals, regionals or, or nationals, and it's just you guys. And I, ha I had a pretty small female team, so I think, and it was like we all depended on each other for every single point. So I think for us, it was just those are my favorite moments because we just knew we had to have each other every day. We pushed each other. We just knew that if anybody slacked, it was coming down hard on the whole team. So yeah, traveling with the team and yeah, just doing it together. So. Awesome. And you girls will keep each other accountable, I'm sure, throughout the season, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> awesome. We're going to, um, in sport, I think we can all relate, even though, you know, the success you guys have gotten um, and your journey from youth to, you know, Olympian, it could appear that of uh, the jersey journey to get there, right? Um, we don't always get to see your struggles, but obviously, there's injuries, there's this, the mental aspect of it. So um, I just wanted to get a little bit into um, that part of your journey as well, because I think it's really important for, you know, younger athletes to hear those parts of your journey as well. So, and this year, especially with COVID, I mean, there's been so many curveballs we've been thrown with. And I know Alicia, starting with you, um, last May during COVID, you competed in a virtual event, the ultimate mm -hmm. um, garden clash, where you competed yeah. against some of the very best women in the world uh, from your very home base in Canada. So mm -hmm. I was wondering for that competition being virtual, um, how mm -hmm. did you motivate yourself for this virtual competition? And can you share some tips with some the younger athletes on how they can keep themselves motivated during this time when you know they don't have mm -hmm. very many opportunities to compete at the moment yeah for me that's kind of the things I was grabbing on to you know I know um for me I use social media to motivate me a lot to see the other people competing I see that I um I want it I want to be the best in the world and I think when you see that happening um in and out on social, you just kind of, you wake up every morning and you have that goal and that purpose to get out there and to keep bettering yourself. Now it is unfortunate with what's going on in Canada, especially when we see different countries and everywhere around competing, but you can always get better. And I think that, that we underestimate the human body and pushing ourselves to these limits and that's where injuries happen. So a lot of people, you know, I used to get really, really upset when I would get injured. And then I started thinking like, how could I switch this to a positive? And the way I started seeing injury was I hit a max. Like I hit that max of what I pushed myself to get that injury. So I know that is my max. And that was so reassuring that we were doing right things because that was my peak. That's as far as I could push myself. So we just learned more. And to me, knowledge is power. The more you know about the human body, the more you know about yourself, the better you become as an individual. Um, and again, like we say, time's going to go by, COVID's going to go by, we're eventually going to be back out there to competing. And so you really have to sit down and write goals every day. It's things you want to accomplish and get up and do because 
there's someone out there that's training and competing and probably trying to get better than you. And so you can say that COVID's an excuse. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of that at the Olympics this year, which might be a little upsetting that, you know, I didn't perform as well because of the circumstances. And I, I really hope a lot of athletes don't complain about that um, because we had a full year and a half break and we, you had potentials of getting out there and training. And if you want it bad enough, then there shouldn't be anything blocking you from doing that. That's great advice. I love how you turn like, you know, what could be seen as a negative into a positive to empower mm -hmm. yourself in an mm -hmm. as an athlete and carry you yeah. forward in your sport. And, mm -hmm. and that's a reality of our sport, right? Injury. Mm -hmm. If you think you're just going to be healthy all along and follow this linear path, no. Um, mm -hmm. definitely listen to these these conversations um, and realize that it is part and Liz I know that behind all of your success you've experienced a fair share of injuries yourself um, over your career injuring your back and your ankle and I guess a little bit of a two-part question here I was wondering what helped you get through these injuries and how would you say it helped you become a better athlete today or how has it shifted your mindset? Like Alicia said, just um, making her feel, you know, stronger and learning more knowledge about herself as an athlete. Yeah, I think, you know, the first time anybody gets injured, you're like, why me? Like, <laughs> it's like, well, everybody, Every, if you, if you, like, you're going to injure yourself eventually. It's probably going to happen some way or another if you're pushing that edge. Um, or you could, you know, just make a bad decision. And sometimes that happens too. Um, you know, fate just happens, whatever. Um, but when I think about the things I've learned from injuries, it's often like, okay, you thought, you know, there's the mountain, here's where you are currently on the path, and you thought you were going to take this route. But then fate said, nope, this one's closed for the season, you got to go this way. And, you know, like, yes, like COVID could be an excuse. And like, yes, it's, it's frustrating. I've had a really hard time just even getting access to a gym or even getting access to the track. And like, my schedule's all over the place. And like, there's a way less consistency. But at the end of it, I was like, well, what can I do? Like, I obviously, I can't be in the gym for two hours now. I have an hour to get in and to get out. So then the question becomes, okay, how efficient can I become at the gym? How effective can I become? What actually matters and what is going to make the javelin further versus what is just making me tired and making me feel like I'm working hard when I'm actually just exhausting myself. So you have a tough situation and you eventually just to say, okay, what's the best choice I can make right now? Or you can say, okay, well, I can't get to the gym. So I'm going to figure out how to do a handstand better or to be able to do like, I figured out how to do a one-armed handstand this year because I was like, well, if I can do that, then my shoulder is strong enough to be able to hoist a javelin further. Therefore, that is a great possibility. And so you can start breaking it down. You can say like, okay, my mental game, like I really struggle at meets. Maybe I need to meditate more. Maybe I need to talk to a sports psych. Maybe I can work on that because I was just working so hard at the gym and the track and showing up and like grinding. It's like, Maybe I can switch gears and work on another part, or maybe I can work on my nutrition. And there's so many things you can do as an athlete. And realistically, it's hard to do them all simultaneously. And when one, again, when one door closes, a window may open. So it's like, okay, where's the window? And what's the thing that can really like set me forward? Because it's often a gift. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it, it's tough the first time you do it, or especially if you're very new and you're very young to the sport. You don't even know that there's all these other possibilities of like a sports site or looking into your nutrition or figuring out like what's the right protocol for ice bath timing, depending on my event. And like Google's an amazing thing. It is your friend. And, you know, there's, there's a never ending list of things to do that you could improve your physiology one or 2%. And that's a lot. It sounds like nothing, but it is a lot. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's, it's an opportunity to be like, okay, how could, what other categories could I improve in as an athlete? Mm -hmm. I love that you bring up those other points because I think especially when we're young we focus so much on okay working hard grind in this especially during university but but realizing that there's so many different aspects to sport and how you can improve yourself as an athlete right like Liz said that mental aspect and, and learning from experience too just like being injured knowing that okay I'm going to be a stronger um, athlete moving forward thanks for sharing that Liz and Another one I think that often comes up is dealing with nerves. So Christabel, I see that you've had quite a lot of success performing on the world stage and you've proven time and time again that you're able to compete under pressure. So I was wondering if you can share kind of what goes through your mind before competing um, to prepare and what tips do you have to share um, for younger athletes to control their nerves before competition? I think nerves are often 
um, thought of as bad, um, but I mean, they're there and I think it's about how you deal with them. So if you can expand a little bit on that. Yeah, um, I definitely get very nervous before I'm competing. Sometimes not even a major meet, like my season opener, I'll be nervous. And it's kind of like your body just knows that something's happening. It might be like a day out or two days out. And then the day of you just wake up and it's just a feeling of something's gonna happen today. And I really just try to breathe through it. And um, I really just try to breathe through it and just say like, you're okay. Like you've done everything you can do. Um, in my preparation to compete, I listen to a wide range of music because I know that if I listen to one type of music and it like gets me too amped up, my heart's gonna be racing. And I don't wanna feel that for forever. I just, I wanna come up and I wanna come down. I wanna come up and I wanna come down. And it's okay to feel, feel the nerves. I think um, as long as you are confident in what you've done to get there and understand that every other competitor probably feels the exact same way. You're not less than because you feel nervous. Um, and I think it's normal. And I think it's very important. If you don't feel any type of anticipation, um, you probably just don't care. And um, that's not that's not good. So yeah, um, for me, I just try to breathe through it. And I just think like, what it, like where's the root of your nervousness coming from? You're just ready to go and that's okay. So yeah. Exactly, that's a great point. If you're, if you're nervous, if your heart's beating, that means you know your blood's pumping faster, your muscles are getting more oxygen and, and you're ready to go. That's, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Christabel. And I think all of these, whether, you know, it's injuries, nerves, um, you know, COVID, remembering that all of us athletes, we all experience those things, right? It's not us. So really important to talk about it. I'm happy we're able to talk about it together today and like encourage everybody to have those conversations with their teammates. And I'm sure you guys can relate, but when you're injured, often there's someone else who's injured, right? And I'm sure you've had that experience of bonding and just feeling better um, being in that same boat as um, the other athlete. Well, all three of you have set out goals for yourself and achieve them. And I feel like each of your strengths, um, determination and limitless mentality has really allowed you guys to break barriers in each of your respective sports. Um, I wanna hear to you know, empower, which I find is very empowering to women, um, younger girls too. So I just wanted to hear from you guys, what advice you have for young girls today? Alicia, I read um, one of your favorite mottos um, mm -hmm. is, never give up, never give in, and never take no for an answer. I feel mm -hmm. like this positive mindset of yours has really helped you become, you know, the strong and powerful, not only athlete, but also woman you are today. So I was wondering mm -hmm. what advice can you share to girls today in sport to help them find their own confidence and strength? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've always said the mind is a powerful thing, but to really convince yourself that you are one of the best in the world, you you know, you got to walk the walk before you talk the talk is what I always say. And uh, fail, just like fail as much as you can, because I can tell you right now, I've never learned from one of my successes. I've always been just thank God that I got to that point. But my failures is what kept motivating me to come back. My failures are the things that like keep like making me wake up every morning so that I can go out and be better tomorrow. Um, and so I, I tell people, you know, I, I used to be so ashamed and so embarrassed and I would cry. My mom, we had a rule, like a 48 hour of, you get 48 hours. Now it's down to like two hours. She says <laughs> I'm allowed to cry after a bad meet. Um, but, and I would just take that time and, and, and really analyze what I did wrong. But, you know, we're all out here trying to be the best versions of ourselves and to do that is you have to believe and you have to have that purpose and goals. So write them down, write the, I write them in a pyramid scheme. So the bottoms are the, you know, short-term goals and the top of my pyramid is, is my, my end all be on what I want to accomplish and track. And, uh, and you slowly work your way up that pyramid and check them all off. I love that pyramid scheme idea mm -hmm. for goal setting. That's a great mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Thanks, Alicia. No problem. And I think in, in sport too, we often see, you know, females in high school dropping out of sport um, for multiple reasons, whether it's lack of access, social stigma, lack of role models. Um, Liz, this was definitely not the case for you. You paved your own path, qualifying for your first Olympics in 2012 and becoming the first female to compete in the Olympic javelin, as I mentioned 
um, at the beginning since 1968. So it's amazing to have you as a role model um, for athletes looking to pursue track and field, especially in Javelin. Um, what would you say to inspire girls to continue in sport? Hmm, that's an interesting one. What would I say to girls who inspire to me in sport? Find your niche. Um, I think people are honestly like, th there's so many things to try in life. And uh, I think a lot of people get really disheartened easily. You're like, for me, like, I'm not a team sport person. It doesn't work for me. <laughs> Um, because I love to try, I love to work hard. I get so upset when I remember I pitch and I per pitch a near perfect game and then someone would be, you know, picking their nose at shortstop and the ball would just pass them by. And I'd just be like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, pay attention. And, um, that was really, that was really, really tough for me. Um, but what I realized is that like when I joined track, I was like, oh, not all sports environments are the same. There's very different people doing different sports. It's not just your body type or something. And when I found track, it was like the thing that I loved about it was this concept of I'm training really hard. Everyone else is training really hard. And yes, I, maybe if they're throwing javelin, we're competing against each other, but like I'm friends with hurdlers, I'm friends with distance runners, I'm friends with sprinters, and they're all giving it their all. <laughs> yeah, pole vaulters. Alicia was my roommate in 2016. It was really wonderful. It was a great time. Um, but <laughs> it's this whole point of so many sports are so different and they have such different mentalities and such different people. And a lot of the time I feel like the whole point of sports is to connect with your body and to connect with the power within yourself and this amazing concept of self-expression. And like when you can connect with your body, whether it's yoga or whether it's track or whether it's softball or whether it's coming together as a team, it doesn't matter. It's this concept that like when you connect to your body, you connect to a different level of being alive. And it's, a, it's like a level of enlightenment to be like, wow, I made my body do that. Or like, wow, I came together with my team. And do not give up if you suck at two or three sports or if you're B plus athlete at everything, because just, just be like, you know what? I gave it a couple of years. I don't love it. Something else. Like it's okay to switch, but I'd say like, don't give up so early or try and taste everything you can as young as you can. So that would be my advice is just try everything because you'll probably find something that you like. Thanks, Liz. I think that is very true. And I guess we're lucky in track and field too, that even within our sport, there are so many different options um, to compete in. And then on top of that, so many different sports out there. So yeah, finding your niche and, and learning more about yourself. And I'm sure you, all of you ladies can say that you've learned so much in the sport that's helped you outside of sport in your life as well. Imagine. Now, Christabel, I read on, yeah, CanFun, one of your favorite uh, quotes is, she believed she could, so she did, by R.S. Gray. Looking at your career, I feel like you set forth a goal and chased it, and you achieved it. So really bringing uh, this quote to life, which is amazing. And certainly, though, you must have had some challenges, challenges sorry, along the way that you faced. I was wondering if you can share a time in your career that you've been challenged and how you overcame it? Okay, I would say probably the hardest season for me would be the year after I broke the Canadian record and then that following year was the Olympic year and coming off of like a record breaking year, I was like, I'm in a good position, you know, just gotta stay healthy and things will go well. and every possible thing that could happen that year happened. Um, I tore my adductor during fall training twice. I had to get PRP, I had to sit out. I had a friend commit suicide. It was just like turmoil, turmoil, turmoil. And I just kept um, saying, I'll just deal with it after the Olympics. I'll deal with it after the Olympics. And I just kept putting it off and I was miserable. I was a walking zombie, I was, it was really a really, really hard season for me. Um, and yeah, I really just kept saying, I'll do it with the after Olympics, I'll handle it after the Olympics. I was very emotional, but I was trying not to like tap into it because I was just had a wall up. My goal was to get to the Olympics and to medal. And um, I remember after I competed and during the qualifying round, I came through the tunnel, you come through the tunnel to come back to the warm up track and you passed the media zone and I remember I was just bawling and I just felt so free I was like oh my gosh it's done and now I can like feel 
And for me, my learning experience in that is your mental health is so important and you can try and push through anything and say for the sport, but you have to understand that if your mental health is not there, like your sport will suffer. So for me, that was such a like mind opening experience for me. And it sucked that it had to come during that season, especially because I came into the season so confident and um, yeah, but that's just life. And I think now moving forward, anytime I have anything come up, I, I do address it. And it, it's better just to, to deal with it in the moment. Um, I have a sports psych now and um, I have a great relationship with my coaches and family and friends. So for me, um, moving forward, I haven't really had the same type of issues, but yeah, I didn't really talk to anybody about it. I was just, I, I think my coach told me, you know, when I came to the warm-up track, he just said, like, he's like, I know, like, you, you've changed. And I guess he really didn't want to dive into it at the time either because he knew how tunnel visioned I was for the Olympics. But yeah, so I would say mental health is extremely, extremely, extremely important. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. And, and definitely it not only affects your sport, but it affects you, which is most important. You want to be happy, um, even if you're performing to the best of your ability, right? And, and how Liz was saying, like, if you're injured, take that opportunity to um, work on the mental aspect as well. And I think it's huge now, Krista Bell, and like learning for everybody, like it's great to be proactive about that mental health, right? Like have that support system in place so that when you do have, um, you know, those tough, challenging times, you're set up um, to get you through them as well. Well, it has been a pleasure chatting. We are getting to, we are at an hour. Um, I know you said that that you're able to stick around a little bit longer for all those listening. I would like to ask, just remind if anybody has any questions um, for these lovely ladies joining us today, please put them into the chat um, and we'll get to them in just two minutes while we wait for any questions. Ladies, we are going to do a few questions, rapid fire questions. So I'll ask a question and just kind of a quick response will go um, kind of keep the pattern, Alicia, Christabel, Liz, for responses. So very first one, um, if you could go back uh, to your kind of high school self, what advice would you give yourself? Start with you, Alicia. Don't worry about what everyone thinks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, should I answer? Are we all doing the same question? Oh, yeah. sorry. What was your answer? I missed it too. Oh, sorry. I said, don't worry about what everyone else thinks. That is great advice. I like mm -hmm. it. Christabel, what about you? Um, I would say enjoy the moments a little bit more. I feel like I was, um, once I decided that I was going to the, to the States and I wanted to take sports series, I kind of just blocked out everything and I didn't really like enjoy my whole high school experience. I didn't even go to prom. I was like, I'm ready to go. Um, yeah. Let me out of here. <laughs> Enjoy the experience. Um, I would say get more sleep. I, oh. I am very guilty. So I went to university and I was like, I'm free. Um, <laughs> and I was, I trained really hard. I studied and I got maybe five hours of sleep a night. And I would live off of coffee and it for sure it ruined my memory. Um, I don't remember a lot from university actually, because I was just, I was never sleeping. And so I didn't get REM and I couldn't convert to long-term memories. And I think it delayed my progress um, really significantly for a couple of years, um, for the first two years. And so I say like, if you understand a couple of things about sleep um, or even like, you know, everybody's raving about the book, why we sleep, but truly it's amazing. I think it should be part of the high school curriculum because if you don't get sleep, you miss out on massive parts of your life and things going well and staying healthy and continuing and like yeah you know you can you can go with less when you're younger and you can survive a little better but I, w I wish I'd gotten more sleep I wish I understood how important it was for everything and it would have like some of the you just understand like a couple fun facts about sleep you'll be like yeah like I'm protecting my sleep and like it really changes your mind about it Yes, absolutely. Academics, performance, everything. All right, we got some questions here. First, Claire has asked advice for getting noticed by colleges. 
So of course you've got streamlined athletes to create a profile <laughs> and search all of the uh, the universities and get noticed by coaches. Um, but from let's um go to Alicia. Maybe you can answer. Mm-hmm. Or sorry, Christabel, because we have a pole vault question coming up. After Christabel. Okay. Um. I would say that it's okay to reach out to schools too. There's so many athletes and a lot of times you can be overlooked. So um, I would say if you have a list of schools that you're interested in, it wouldn't hurt to shoot them an email, get um, make an athletic profile, just say, these are my events, these are my marks. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, get in touch with the coach and that's okay too. Definitely. Thanks, Christabel. Uh, Next, we have a question from Sierra. So she is a pole vaulter from Edmonton and was Mm -hmm. wondering how training is right now due to COVID. Oh, training. Well, I'm thankful because I'm a part of the Kate program and the Olympic program here in Toronto. So um, the facilities are open for me and for my training. Um, again, though, still in the hub, I'm like the Liz situation. We get an hour in the weight room. So you just got to be a little more efficient. Um, but last year with all the city rules here in Toronto, my coach and I ended up renting a warehouse right at the beginning of, um, I guess of COVID and we own that. We will not own it. We rent it, but we, it's, we have the keys for it. So we go in there and training and do what we need for the pole vault side on that. Thanks, Alicia. Hopefully that answers, yeah, shares a little insight, Sierra. Um, we have another one here. So um, saying, so awesome to see such incredible women on this panel. Question, what was a career defining moment for each of you? Was there a moment you really felt a shift and knew that being an athlete long-term uh, or going pro was going to be in your future? Let's start with you, Liz. Yeah, so for me, <laughs> I, um, I'm in Lethbridge right now, but when I decided I wanted to go pro, I was training in Vancouver. I was, um, I'd switched degrees. So I was in the fifth year of my program, but I was taking two courses per semester, which is like nothing. And I was just trying to train full time. And I really wanted to like throw a javelin. I was like, yeah, I want to go to the Olympics. And then I realized in April of 2011, that that situation wasn't right for me and it wasn't going to get me to the Olympics. And so I had this idea. I was like, well, I know there's this really great coach in Lethbridge and Lethbridge is two hours south of Calgary. It's about I think it's 80,000 people maybe. And I was like, I had this idea. And then a week later I was like, I'm going. (laughs) And so I like stopped school. I like went from home. I left Vancouver, which like I'd never lived anywhere else. And I drove to Alberta. And I remember I got here at like midnight on a Sunday or midnight on Saturday. And then Sunday morning, I was like, I'm going to go check out Lethbridge. And um, Lethbridge is very different from Vancouver. It was also summer, so it's a university town. It had emptied out. It was Sunday. It's a religious place, so everything is closed. And I'm driving through downtown. There's not a soul downtown. And I'm like, wow, what have I done? And then as I'm wondering this, a, a tumbleweed literally rolls across the street. And I'm like, oh my God, I've really committed to being here for Javelin. And it, it was amazing. Like we trained 10 times a week between Monday and Friday. I threw javelins six times a week. I threw balls four times a week. We lifted heavy six times a week. It was a really intense training program, but it was this point where I was like, I will do anything. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't care what it takes. Like I'm going to the Olympics, hell or high water and mm-hmm. like just try and stop me. And so it was really this point, like there was, there was truly a shift where it's like, what are you willing to do for this thing mm-hmm. that you supposedly want? And I stopped half doing it, half doing school. And I was like, nope, here we go. Like, you kind of have that point where you know you're close, but you're not close enough. And it needs to be hard, but not too hard. Mm-hmm. So. Thanks, Liz. Uh, we'll go to Christabel next. So for me was my junior year of college. So that was 2012. And I told myself that year I was going to make the Olympic team. And um, back then they had a different qualifying um you had, you could get like two B's or you could get like an A. They had like a rising star or something. So anyways, I was planning yeah. to go to the Olympics, okay? And I was, it was our first training session back from Christmas break in the weight room and I was power cleaning and my back just spasmed out and I dropped the weight and I didn't know what happened. I went to go see the trainer. At the time, we were in transition. We didn't have like a, a proper um, physio for the team so we just had like a student trainer 
and they did not know what was going on. I went that whole year and I was hurdling at the time too. And I was having spasms down my leg. I could barely sit in a car. I would have to like roll out of bed. It was just, I suffered that whole year and I obviously didn't make the Olympic team. And that summer they hired a new trainer and she actually happened to be connected with um, my main pyro in Vancouver. Um, yeah, so they put together a program for me. I rehabbed all summer and um, my pain went away. I ended, I had a herniated disc, that's what it was. And my pain went away and I came back for my senior year and I cut off so many friends that I could just, you know, kick it with. And I was like, I'm going to focus this year. Like nothing's going to distract me. And yeah, I just went hard that year. And my, I ended up coming second in C's that year. And then my first meet outdoors, I hit the world standard. And for me, I was like, yes, I'm on the right path. I'm doing what I need to do. And I was like, sky's the limit right now. So, yeah. Thanks, Crystal. It sounds like just that focus and yeah, being all in in the sport and chasing your goals. Now for sake of time, Alicia, I think we'll kind of combine two questions. Yeah, no problem. Off. I know it's getting late for some of you. Um, so in addition to that, um, maybe if you can add as well um, share what advice would you give a uh, first year college athlete as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me, the switch, I kind of, I was kind of blindsided because when I was little, I knew I wanted to go to the Olympics. Every two years, I'd be like, mama, mama, put the Olympics on, whether it was winter or summer. I just loved watching the athletes compete on the TV. I thought it was so powerful and so beautiful. Um, so that's why I started in gym and then got too tall, injured myself, retired at the age of 13, um, and then took a full year off because I fractured my L5 vertebrae um, in my back and somehow found my way to track and field well you know my first meet out I broke a meet record and then I just kept raising the bar literally <laughs> until I was the first high school girl to jump four and as soon as I jumped four another door opened it was like okay did you know you can get full ride scholarship to the states I said oh that'd be amazing my parents wouldn't have to pay for school so I go down to university I'm there and then all of a sudden I broke the school record I was like oh this feels nice I really like this and it just kept getting more and more I never I never really liked the like nine to five or sitting down and and, and doing my schoolwork I really was a active hands-on person um, I love those mechanic classes where you're building things I, I was very much um, a visual learner and so once I started getting better and we started now having iPads at practices I started developing a lot more fast as an athlete um I soon later jumped the olympic standard in 2016 and at that moment it was a switch it was uh, the acc record and i was runner up at ncaa's i just i could tell a whole shift of, of wave of movement that i wasn't even 50 percent of where i could be as a, as an athlete and uh that's kind of where you kind of see it it's, it's being able to be in that top 15 in the world um that was the shift for me that um i knew i was going to kind of make it there but again i think when i went to first year university for me was it was a huge adjustment you know I was in a completely different country um it was hard to try to not gain weight um that freshman 15 is a thing but it's not because of just food it's because of workouts and stress and hormones and dealing with a lot more than just you know moving away from home for the first time and so I think the best advice I have is um is finding that that social balance that you have someone to lean on while you're there. Um, having that good support system and having people that you can really, um, really talk to through that. And that comes down with the mental health is um, knowing knowing what works and what doesn't work for you. And so I think the, the best advice I have for like freshmen is do what you love and make sure you're happy doing it. If, if it, you're not in an environment that you don't want to be in, then don't be there. You know, you can always transfer back. You can always go somewhere else. And, um, and that's, that's the one thing I've always told people. And I never understood when people are in situations that they're really upset. It's like, leave the situation. No one's holding you there. And so again, it's your world. Nobody has to walk in those shoes and nobody will ever be able to walk in your shoes. So do what's best for you. Thanks, Alicia. And mm -hmm. I think like all of you girls have said, it's like live in the moment, be present, enjoy it, be balanced, mm -hmm. make sure you're happy doing what 
you're doing, right? Um, mm -hmm. In sport, in life. Um, yeah, important to be happy. Well, ladies, it was such a pleasure um, this evening. Streamline Athletes really appreciate you taking the time to share your journey and all of this advice with us all. I feel like we could continue talking forever um, and answering mm -hmm. questions, um, but due to time, I want to wrap things up and just wish the best of luck to all of you as you train um, to prepare for Tokyo 2021 um, and know that Streamline Athletes, all of us, we're cheering you on. For everybody joining us this evening, uh, these athletes are all over our socials, so please make sure you give them a follow to follow in their jersey journeys and um, cheer them all on and also um, give Streamline athletes a follow too. Um, I just want to say have a great everybody, a great night everybody. Here, I'm getting tired too. Um, <laughs> and I will let you know, yeah, just say bye if you'd like. Thanks guys. Bye. Thanks for joining.